So, well, I'm Brian Cade, and uh, I've been asked to come and do a workshop, and I've decided to go back in time in some way, And because uh, one thing I'm very interested in, I've got tapes of myself that go back to about 1974, and what I've been very interested in is not only the way I've changed, but the way I haven't changed. And one of the, th the things that I notice most is that I've always used humour, and so I've got a lot of examples, both uh, on videotape, as well as examples of it that I can relate about situations where the unexpected, are hu uh, often using humour, uh, seems to have produced a turning point. And I will only talk about cases that where I know the outcome. I will never show a tape of a, of a case where I don't know what the long-term outcome is. And uh, so how it will go will partly depend on the audience and which direction it will go will partly depend on the audience. Um, but overall, I intend to show some pieces of work covering a number of years. In some of them, I should look a young and sprightly and uh, slim young man. Um, and then you'll see the gradual ageing process. Yeah. He got in touch with us. Um, he wanted to go to Wimbledon. The MRI were having a conference in Spain, so he said, would we put on a workshop? And so we said yes. And I met him at the, um, yeah. at the airport, not really knowing what to look at. This little old man came out with a pork pie hat on and a little shuffle. And, oh, my God. And we got in the car and we started talking and we made we were friends instantly. Mm. And he came and did a workshop for us. He wasn't actually a very good workshop presenter, um, but had a razor mind and was wonderful to talk with cases about. And so I used to go to the MRI quite regularly and uh, sit behind the screen with them and had the... Uh, I think the, the compliment of being given the honorary position of it, in a sense, being a member of the team, rather than just being a visitor and made to sit at the back, and, and got to know them all quite well. So it's been quite sad for me over the last few years to be writing obituaries for John, and then for Paul Watsovic, and then more recently for Dick Fish. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, one of the things I'm going to do today is to, to uh, I call it rehabilitating pragmatics, mm -hmm. to dedicate the day to their memory, because they've had such a profound influence on my work. Mm. Uh, and still, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm, I've retired now, but up until I retired, it still had a very profound influence, the background of um, the more of the same. Uh, but it, um, it really basically met John because he wanted to go to Wimbledon. Um, <laughs> and then you became friends uh, yes. subsequently. Yes, yeah. yes, we kept in touch. He came, stayed with us in um, Sydney on a couple of occasions, did workshops there. Mm. And I was quite often in, well, I say often, so sometimes twice a year in Palo Alto. Mm and uh, would stay with him and his wife. And, uh, uh, and he once actually had the, uh, he, he invited me to consult for a man he was seeing in his own room, not as part of the team, because he was stuck with it, which was quite a, a compliment. And it was quite funny as well, because the man was a professional and had asked John to see him because he so admired John. And that kind of got stuck, I think, in a sort of uh, mentor-client uh, position. And, we did, whilst it wasn't planned, we spent most of the time the client and I taking the mick out of John, who was sat there with his pipe with that look on his face. And I thought it somehow it changed the balance. It took John off of the pedestal and allowed them then to discuss things more as equals and to, and to start ending the therapy. Mm. It's quite it was an interesting experience. They were part of the Bateson project initially and then they moved on to... Bateson. Bateson. <laughs> you mean et al? Yes, he, uh, jo John Very was. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yes, but um, yes, another thing it was only John because mm. John Jackson died, mm. and Haley went off to work with um, Mnuchin, you know, and then made his own, in own institute. But John was one of the original mm. um, so-called Bateson project. He was one of the three that did all the work on families, and Bateson would swan around having esoteric ideas, mm. um, arcane interests. Uh, mm. Because I remember saying to John once, uh, to admitting to him, saying, actually, quite frankly, I, when I read Bates, and I'm really not quite sure what he's talking about. And he said, actually, between you and me, we never understood what he was talking about either. <laughs> but he was very good because he would allow us to get on uh, with what we were interested in, and he supported our work. Um, so in that sense, he was a very good leader. Other than that, they never knew what he was talking about half the time. <laughs> so that was a relief. I think it was, I can't remember the date, it's probably about 79 I met up, so it would have been within like two or three years. Um, we went to a, I think the first training conference that Luigi and Gianfranco put on in Brussels, and it was by invitation. 
and uh, Philip and I, Philip and Sally one and I, we somehow meshed with them. And from then on we would meet at conferences and spend vast amounts of time in bars <laughs> discussing things which sometimes included family therapy. <laughs> and uh, uh, sort of driving around listening to Albanoni and things, uh, things like that. Uh, mm. But we became actually quite close. It, it, was, it was good fortune at that time to be able to meet these people because around the same time I met De Chaser. And he was another person that I made a, a strong friendship with, and another person I sadly recently had to write an obituary for. So I can remember me meeting uh, Steve Deshazo once, um, having a meal with him, and asking him how did he arrive at his way of working and thinking, and his response to me was, clients! Yes, <laughs> and you got the voice right too. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said that, Joe Haley's book, I think it was Strategies of Strategies Shelf, 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 yeah. Head, no, that was my, was that that's my statement, you yes. <laughs> but no, he might have done, yes. It was, it was Lynn Hoffman that asked me once. Um, Philip and I had done a workshop at, at one of these international things, and Lynn Hoffman said, where did you get this Groucho Marx approach to therapy from? And I said, I was walking down the road to Damascus one day, this green book fell out of the sky and hit me on the head, the Strategies of Psychotherapy. And I read that, and it just changed everything, reading about Ericsson. Um, but uh, opening up the possibilities of uh, being more yourself and using different facets of yourself. And, uh, mm. and it certainly was a license to use what I use a lot of, of humour. It was in my training, that was a no-no. You know, mm. Humour was something to be frowned upon and to have another ten years of analysis about uh, to deal with your oral sadism or whatever they used to call it. I'm Max von Boventer. I'm here at the uh, Family Institute doing the master's course in uh, systemic psychotherapy. I really like Brian's offbeat sense of humour. He, he seems to be a maverick um, and, uh, and he seems to be making really genuine, real relationships with his clients. I do like that about him. Um, there's also, I think what I'm taking away most is uh, a sense that because Brian has got quite some charisma about him, uh, and he can pull things off that other people, including myself, probably couldn't pull off. I think what I'm aiming for is not to be copying Brian, not to be the best Brian I can be, but actually to be the best Max I can be in a therapy room. Actually, I think John Cleese himself um, said that fun, humor, writing about humour is a way of killing it. Uh, I had the ridiculous experience of at a conference of the, with um, Carl Whittaker. Whittaker was late. So they came to... Um, Robin Skinner and I said, would you mind going up on stage and sort of entertaining the troops as, as it were? And we, we, neither of us were very keen on the idea, but we said, OK then, because uh, we were both known for using humour and absurd, which is what the conference is about. And uh, I was up there answering a question that someone asked about using humour. And as I looked around, I looked down right in front of me was John Cleese. And fortunately, he was looking up and nodding and smiling. Had he been frowning, I'm not sure quite what, <laughs> what I'd have done. I think I would have just crept off the stage. <laughs> I think had I miscued it, that would have shown itself a little earlier. But let's, let's, let's okay, see, we got to this point, and all of a sudden she thought, what will that do? I would have probably come up with something. I don't know, but I had enough trust in myself to know that I would come up with something. <laughs> and it probably would have been around, uh, uh, this is a way of breaking a pattern which looks as if it has you under control. Uh, or something like that. I mean, I'll yeah. use those words, but I would have found a way of... Bulimia is, is this rituals around bulimia. Yes, it would have been something like breaking the pattern of and, yes. And you're giving her a new ritual that she has yeah. to go through before she can do the other. So it's almost placing one ritual with another ritual. And Richard, you, you and, and Philippa did a lot of work in Scandinavia. Uh, I, I wouldn't say a lot. We went there a couple of times. A couple of times. Yes. Yeah. But you certainly opened up the, the, the world of, of family therapy in the UK. And, and in, in I would like to think we did quite, we made quite, I mean there were lots of other people, I mean, it, was, it was buzzing, mm -hmm. like, there were lots of places, but um, certainly from using the more MRI derived, um, before we got contaminated with Milan, um, uh, that uh, we were very sort of, uh, we had a unique, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't anybody else that I'm aware of, that was teaching and uh, in that kind of style, and then I, I meshed the two. I thought I, I, I found no problem in meshing some aspects of the Milan. I was never sold totally mm -hmm. on the Milan approach, whereas the rest of the institute at that time moved wholesale over. I retained um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a loyalty is the wrong word, but I, it, it remained my mm -hmm. underpinning that notion of the attempted solution has become the problem, mm -hmm. and what we're looking at is repeating patterns mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, <coughs> which, uh, which 
Both Luigi and Gemma Van Gogh approved of. They never wanted people to be acolytes. They were, and, and so did Steve Deshaies. I have a take which I might show, use today, with, uh, which I made in Milwaukee. He said, look, don't do a solution focus interview unless it's natural. Just do the way you would work the way you would work. And, uh, mm. and it's very much a, a, an MRI derived mm. with my own bits of garnish in. And, uh, so a, it sounds as though there's a lot of, lot of freedom in there but a, a structure that allows you to work off that freedom. Yes. The structure is, uh, is a very simple one, but the implications of it is very profound. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I find it's, whether I'm supervising, I do supervise at the moment, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm no longer seeing clients. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was always the underpin. And it, 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 for instance, when I'm super, supervising somebody and they're stuck with a family, almost the first question that comes to my mind is, uh, what have you been trying to do? Uh, or if I were to ask the family, what's this therapist been trying to do? Well, how would they answer? And then you usually get the answer to why you're stuck. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the father is, thinks I'm trying to get him to be more involved with the kids. Right, is it working? No. <laughs> okay, so what can you do differently? Um, so that uh, you open up more possibilities. And it will, involve, it will obviously inevitably involve some kind of different way of talking with the father. Okay, well, I guess the, the, the sorts of things that seem you know, interesting and important to me at the moment are Brian talking about his use of humour in his work. I've really enjoyed that. But it's also making me think about a family I'm working with at the moment. And I suppose the, the thing that stands out for me is that thing where he, did, he talked about pros and cons. And if you colonise your client's pros, then th th in a way that they can't inhabit that space. Um, and I, I like that, and it made me wonder how I might use that with my, with my clients. So I'm, I'm wondering how I might use it there, not so much the humour, but the sort of pros and cons and not colonising their space too much. I remember being struck by the, uh, the nine dot problem. Oh, right. In, uh, I, think, I can't remember whether it was in Change or whether uh, change, it, I think, yes. it was in Change, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that idea of thinking literally outside of the yes. box. And it's surprisingly easy when you know. <laughs> One solution that uh, I came across subsequently was lovely. It was a, a young kid. He said, "You just get a huge, big, fat pen, and you just do it in one, <laughs> one slice." <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. The rule which says you can only use straight lines. So what if, if you think, "What oh, hell with the rule?" You can join them together much more easily using curved lines. And I, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I can't yeah. remember who gave me that as an analogy, but it seemed a good idea at the time. Mm -hmm. That why, why should we think of ourselves in these kind of straight jackets? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so coming back to the work that you did with um, the Milan team, um, <clears throat> how much was uh, was Mara Salvini Palatoli involved in? She wasn't. No. Um, I met her, and she did a workshop in Cardiff, which I um, organised. Um, and uh, but I never worked with her. We we also visited her in Milan, but we never actually worked directly with her. Uh, when we came across them, it was at the point at which they'd split, gone their different ways. And we asked Myra to come over as a separate um, uh, person, wasn't with Luigi Gianfranco. And she was delightful. I thought she's a very bossy woman, a very, very powerful woman. She was about one foot tall. Mm -hmm. And she was one of those people that would walk into the room and she would be the centre of the room. Uh, and, uh, and I have this, well, this lovely memory of having um, breakfast in Heidelberg, I think it was, at a conference where Michael White was going to give a presentation. And she was going to do a response to it. And she'd w written out her response before he'd given the paper. <laughs> And she was determined that uh, his, his idea of, um, of externalization was just like the old-fashioned idea of demons. Uh, and she was quite dismissive of, <laughs> it's quite interesting here, over, over breakfast, sort of going through this and, and saying, that this is terrible, uh, this is just like demonology. And, uh, uh, but I didn't, we didn't really work with her. Um, uh, but uh, she and my daughter got on extremely well. And I always remember walking around Flandaff Cathedral and I was supposed to be driving her to the airport, and, uh, and uh, that she, she's holding my daughter's hand, and they're looking around the church and looking. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm saying, Mara, uh, we, we need to get going soon. And she says, "Be quiet. I'm Abigail, and I are talking to each other." <laughs> so there was I, about one foot tall. <laughs> I'm just the chauffeur. But, uh, but we didn't actually work with her, um, and her style had dif disappeared off into the um, invariant prescription which I actually found quite helpful as well. I think there was some, a lot to be said for that. <coughs> Excuse me. But it received a lot of flack as well, mm. because it was seen as family bra blaming, and apparently you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to say that families actually do things wrong. 
Um, some of the ones I met did, but uh, somehow that's, that became very co non-kosher at that point. And, uh, and she did sort of go overboard a bit, I think. Um, but that was Mara. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed Brian's genuineness and his um, use of self and his curiosity. And I think that, that curiosity about clients in general, not just the, the problem that they bring uh, to counselling, and seeing the client as a holistic person um, rather than a problem. And what I've got out of today, I think, is looking at um, the the use of the pros and cons. Um, there's something about the, the diagram on the board that Brian did, a, it's like a heart shape, and it almost feels like that the, where the pros and cons overlap is um, an ingrained part of oneself, something that the client owns and uh, goes very deep. And how um, just by empathising with that client's internal frame of reference that I could tap into that. Mm. But you ran a project for 10, ten years almost, was searching uh, Milan approach. I don't know how long it went, but we, yeah, we would meet once a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was B.B. Philippa, Phil Kingston, mm -hmm. and from Bristol University and myself, and we called it The Project. And we would just test out the ideas, um, which led to some really fascinating experiences and team struggles and, uh, and who has the right to, to, to pick up the phone and who has the right, who has the best ideas, yeah. all those kinds of things. In fact, we wrote about the struggle. But, um, that you and Doug Brunin have written about the strategic use of telephone. Oh. Do you remember the, the ideas around that course of the session? Yeah, and we used to do things like we'd, I'm, I'm ringing, up, ringing up and uh, the therapist picked the phone up and said, can I speak to the adolescent please? And you have a word with adolescents. You know, well, how do you think it's going? Um, and, uh, uh, and I can't actually remember specific examples, um, but I, I do remember actually once with um, uh, Hugh Jenkins was the therapist when he was training with us, and uh, he was working with a woman who had some experience in the field. I'm not quite sure what it was, so knew what role play meant, and she had had some fairly unpleasant things happen in her life, and she was f needing to make a decision but couldn't make the decision, and. Hugh had moved into a helpful mode, and she was yes butting. So I rang through and uh, suggested that they do a reverse role play, and that she play him and he play her, and, and for him to yes but. And so they did that, and it was fascinating. I mean, it, was, it was identical, it was the same interview, just the other people doing it. So I then telephoned again, and Hugh picked the phone up, and I said, no, no, I want to speak to the therapist, please. So he passed, passed the phone over to the woman, and I said, look, I, your ideas seem very um, pertinent, but somehow they're not coming across. Why did she come behind the screen for consultation? So she came behind the screen, said with, intuition, with smugness, I'm just going to speak to my colleagues. <laughs> and we kept her in role and we discussed how the ideas were quite, you know, uh, had validity but, and, and she said, well, I think it's probably a too soon. You know, the, 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 perhaps I'm, I'm pushing him to move too quickly. And said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So we helped her to construct an intervention. So she went back and gave this intervention. <laughs> And then, they got, and then she asked him if he'd like another appointment, and he said yes. So made this appointment, got to the door, and didn't know which way one of them should go. But what was interesting, of course, as you would, would guess, she then took her own advice and, and, and substantially, re not resolved, but made significant de decisions between how she had been at the beginning of the session and how she was at the end. And we did that a couple of times. Yeah, I'm Sarah Wheatcroft, and I'm on my, coming up to the end of my first um, year of the two-year um, MSc training here at the Family Institute. Um, so I was really keen to come and see Brian Kay today. I particularly enjoyed, there was, because I'm in training here, um, it's, a lot has resonated. I'm starting to think much more about um, those sorts of ideas that Brian's been bringing up um, to do with my actual clients. And um, particularly, um, the yes but that he mentioned, was, it amused me because um, I've had examples where um, I've had clients who've um, particularly uh,
come up with those sorts of, uh, of answers when I've been um, trying to be helpful and useful in therapy, um, particularly in some group work, and they've been saying, yes, but, yes, but, and it just resonated for me because um, there's, there's a way that you, 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 you can learn, and the wisdom that Brian's brought um, to today is that in a way you have to go with that, and I think it sort of reinforces the idea of the, the joining um, in, uh, with, with your client, so the building of the therapeutic relationship, very, very important. So I've really taken that from today, yeah. Brian would always say that um, I, I don't know what I'm going to do today. Um, I, I'll know when, when the workshop's finished. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sort of lying, but not lying. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I obviously know what I'm going to cover, mm -hmm. in the sense I have to choose what tapes to bring. Mm -hmm. well, not, well, not tapes, that shows my age, isn't it? Sure. DVDs to bring. <coughs> but how it will go. Mm -hmm. um, well, it starts off with a sleepless night. Mm -hmm. And uh, me cursing myself, thinking, why don't I prepare in the same way as other people do? Why don't I have PowerPoint? I actually do have one, but with some cartoons on it. Um, but I, that never worked for me. Um, and whenever, once I did try it, I made a total pig's ear of it, because it wasn't me. Um. Hi, I'm Jill Lubienski. I'm on the master's course here at the Family Institute, and I'm also working part-time for Action for Children. That's one of the um, big reasons for coming, so that we can kind of catch up on everybody's um, positions where they are, what's happening, uh, and then of course to see somebody like Brian Cade, who um, I, haven't, I haven't seen before, um, but I am um, kind of just keen to learn a bit more about him, and I've really enjoyed his use of himself in the work, and that's, some, that's just something that I've, uh, I'm quite um, interested in at the moment, so that's the bit that I'm kind of picking up on most, I think. Um, don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't do what I do, but learn from what I do. <laughs> so it, it's about um, being part of a community, which I know is an important part of the thing that the Family Institute tried to do, and I think they succeed in doing on days like this. So I would hope that, coming back to your original question, that we can have, it's called a commute conversation, isn't it, nowadays? Is that what you do? Yeah. In old days, we used to talk to each other, but apparently you have conversations, <laughs> isn't it? Except you have to say it correctly. I understand it has to be said with a degree of reverence. <laughs> you, have, you have a conversation. Is that right? It sounds like it. Sounds about it. it. Yeah. Good, good, good. I know. I want to have it accurate. Um, well, should we talk some more later? I could do, yes. <laughs> okay. Over a glass of wine? That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did that give you what you wanted? <laughs>